My thyroid blood tests are normal, but I feel terrible. Part 1. Hi, I'm Dr. So Parker. Welcome to PESA Productions' third video in Section 1 on thyroid eye disease. This video is entitled, My Thyroid Blood Tests Are Normal, But I Feel Terrible, Part 1. If you haven't already seen the previous two videos from this series, we strongly encourage you to do so, as we are building on previously presented information. The material in this series is meant to be easily understood. Parts, however, may be somewhat dense, and you may wish to review particular sections. If you have suggestions on how to improve this series, we welcome your comments. You may find us on the web at www.plasticeyesurgery.com, email us at info at pesahouston.com, write to us at Plastic Eye Surgery Associates, 3730 Kirby Drive, Suite 900, Houston, Texas, 77098, or telephone us at 713-795-0705. The point of this video is to explain how the tests used to evaluate thyroid status may not be tailored to your personal situation, and therefore may not really be applicable to you. We also hope to provide a little insight into why your test results may fluctuate. You may be wondering why your blood tests are normal, but you feel as though your thyroid hormone level is too high or too low. If so, you are not alone. This is a very common complaint. Many people also experience that their blood test results keep changing, whether or not they feel any different. Hopefully, this video will shed light onto these questions. Remember TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone produced by the pituitary gland at the base of the brain to stimulate the release of T4 and T3 from the thyroid gland? To understand what's considered a normal TSH value, we have to look at the NANES-3 study NHANES stands for the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, a program of studies designed to assess the health and nutritional status of adults and children in the United States. The NANES 3 study is the third study of a series that was conducted between the years 1988 and 1994. This particular part of the study that interests us looked at 17,353 people randomly selected to be representative of people in the United States in order to determine the normal range of TSH in the general population. Over 23% of the randomly selected people were then excluded for having previously known or newly recognized thyroid disorders. Let's take a moment to think about this. That's amazing! Nearly one out of every four people randomly selected off the street in the United States may have a thyroid disorder. This truly astounding finding caused the NANES study to publish the following declaration. A large proportion of the U.S. population unknowingly have laboratory evidence of thyroid disease, which supports the usefulness of screening for early detection." End quote. As a result, most primary care physicians routinely check for thyroid level abnormalities in regular blood test screenings. After excluding those with known thyroid disorders, 13,344 subjects remain for assessment of normal TSH levels. The study encompassed people of a wide age range. Essentially anyone over the age of 12 years old was included, so everyone 12 to 90 years old made up this population. This means that people who had not yet reached puberty were thrown into the same pool as people who were post-pubescent with those who were post-menopausal. We have to wonder at the sense of doing this since we know that testosterone and estrogens have an impact on thyroid state and the function of the thyroid hormones. Both of these hormones change with puberty in male and female menopause. Both genders were included although we know that androgens and estrogens affect thyroid activity. People of all body size were included. Height, weight, and obesity were not considered, even though we know that fat produces estrogens. All races were included. In fact, special effort was made to include people of varied ethnicity. No family history was included or taken into account, even though we know that genetics plays a significant role in thyroid disorders. Substance use and abuse, both legal and illegal, were not accounted for. A problematic issue when we know that several substances, most notably alcohol 
may significantly impact thyroid activity. People who are excluded who are taking certain medications, specifically testosterone, estrogens, and lithium, but many other medications are believed to affect thyroid activity, and other sources of estrogen were not controlled. Smoking and diet were not controlled for. We know that both of these can have a profound impact on thyroid levels and thyroid function. This study hoped to define a normal range for TSH in the general population. Remember that TSH changes as thyroid hormone T4 and T3 changes. All three, TSH, T4, and T3, may be affected by numerous factors that were not accounted for in this study, such as hormone state, gender, age, and race. Increased estrogen levels tend to be associated with a higher TSH, as is increased age in Anglo-Saxon or Mexican heritage. Consider that the 13-year-old vegetarian 80-pound African-American girl's TSH is assessed on the same reference range as the 280-pound 50-year-old smoking and drinking white male. Bear with me here as we go through just a little simple graphing and math. I think you'll see how incredibly important it is for you to understand this information. Here we see what's called a bell-shaped or Gaussian standard distribution curve. In a general sense, the vertical or up and down axis typically represents the number of individuals counted. Along the horizontal axis, we show a zero in the middle of the graph and numbers one, two, and three to the right of the zero and negative one, two, and three numbers to the left. These numbers represent what we call standard deviations from the norm or differences from the average or the expected. In this graph, the standard deviations are also color coded so that one standard deviation, either higher or lower than the norm, is colored dark blue. The second standard deviation, either higher or lower than the norm, is a lighter blue. And the third standard deviation is even lighter. You will also see percentages written in the colored bars within the graph. Let's look at the darkest blue. First standard deviations above and below zero. You will see 34.1% written on either side of zero. That means that 34.1% of the population will fall within this range above the average and 34.1% will fall below the average within this range. So 68.2% of the population fall within the first standard deviation from the average or norm or the expected. The second standard deviation includes another 13.6% above and below the first standard deviation, accounting for a total of 95% of the population within two standard deviations above and below the norm or the average expected. Let's look at a specific example of how the Gaussian curve might be used. Again, the vertical axis is the number of individuals, but in this case, the horizontal axis represents height. Let's assume 100 men are measured for height and the average height is, say, 5 foot 10 inches. As an aside, for the purists, we won't distinguish among average, median, and mode here. So, if the average man is 5 foot 10, that means that half the men are shorter than 5 foot 10, and half are taller. But that doesn't really tell us much about the distribution of height. How tall is the tallest? How short is the shortest? How many are above 6 feet? Etc. Let's say that after measuring everyone and doing some math, we find out that roughly 68% of the men fall within eight inches of the average, with half of them being within four inches under five foot 10, and half being within four inches above five foot 10 inches. So roughly 38% are between five foot six inches and five foot 10 inches. And roughly 38% measure between five foot 10 and six foot two. That means the first standard deviation is four inches. The second standard deviation adds another 13.6 above and below the first standard deviation. So if we say that the second standard deviation is another eight inches, four inches on either side of the first standard deviation, then roughly 95%, that's 13.6 plus 34.1 times two, of the men fall between five foot two and six foot six inches. Remember that another 5% of the population will be even shorter 
or taller. The NANES 3 study determined that based upon the population they studied, normal range for TSH out to two standard deviations is 0.3 to 2.5. That means that 95% of the people tested should have a TSH within that range, and this is the range that laboratories will typically use to report, quote, normal values. There are two essential points to keep in mind. First, 5% of the normal population will normally fall outside of this range. So for 2.5% of the population, a TSH above 2.5 may be normal. Second, this range may not be reflective of your particular situation. Depending upon your age, gender, race, height, weight, medications, genetics, etc. To hammer home the point of how arbitrary these numbers are, the NANES 3 recommendations were instituted in 2002. Before that time, the normal range of TSH was believed to be 0.5 to 5. So overnight, someone who had a TSH of 0 0.4 in 2001 and was believed to have a low TSH and therefore a high T4 and T3 was diagnosed with hyperthyroidism and may have been treated with surgical removal of their thyroid gland, today would be considered to be normal. Conversely, someone who had had a TSH of 4.0 in 2001 and was considered normal would now be managed as though they were low thyroid and be given thyroid medication. Totally arbitrary. Even the NANES researchers realized how arbitrary their findings were and along with the suggestion for a dramatic change in the, quote, normal range for TSH, they made the following statement. Quote, These recommendations, however, come with the proviso that sound clinical judgment based on findings other than TSH concentrations should be exercised with regard to initiating treatment. End quote. In essence, they are saying that a person's signs and symptoms, not the blood tests alone, should dictate the changes in treatment. This is a significant departure from how some physicians treat thyroid disorders. Treat the person, not their test results. To summarize, T4, T3, and TSH blood test normal ranges are quite arbitrary and may not apply to everyone. When we mentioned all the factors that influence TSH levels, many of these may change, creating changes in a person's thyroid status and subsequent management needs. The following video, video 4 of section 1, really knocks this point home.